Hello everyone, welcome to Chasing a Murderer. Today we are on part 113 of Life Beyond the Grave, which is attached to the Lori Ballow and Chad Daybell case. Before we get started, I would like to ask if you enjoy my work, you like the work that I do, don't forget to subscribe, like, make sure you send your ideas to the comments section so I can know what you guys think. And I want to do a shout out to several people for right now. I, I want to make a special video for my Patreons, but um, I have my first thanks from Crazy Mom. Make sure you go check out her channel, by the way. Other um, channels like Difficult Research, Just Alum, and Nate Eaton, they all are the top investigators for this um, Lori Vallow and Chad Dabell case. Okay, let's not waste any more time jibber-jabbering. Let's go ahead and get into this case, the timeline. And we're going to actually focus a little bit more on Chad Daybell and his family, at least at the start of this video. And we're going to refer to some of Tammy Daybell's neighbors slash friends slash church members. Now, remember, we heard from Heather Daybell that said that Tammy seemed to have depression issues. She was not one to really talk much. And my goodness, this woman has a lot going on in her life that she's keeping to herself. Her husband's cheating. She must understand this. She works her butt off for her family. She's a good person. And they're starting to have financial issues. This has been mentioned by Chad and Tammy, both alike. Why are they have financial issues? Well, it seems that Chad has been meeting Lori instead of working, instead of making money for his rendezvous with his lover, Lori Vallow. We hear that they've been meeting at hotels and her home at times. And Chad has dropped everything he worked hard on for his entire life to just throw it away for a woman he's lusting after. Or did he? Maybe Chad Daybell's interest in what he was doing, the spotlight, the books, was to have these rendezvous. Who I feel sorry for the most are Chad Daybell's children because he's he doesn't care about them. He's manipulating them. He doesn't care about his wife, Tammy, who gave birth to five children for him, who sacrificed her happiness for Chad Daybell, moving away from her family, giving up everything she ever wanted to make him happy. And even during this time, Tammy's feeling heartache. She's having a tough time. She's scared. You know, their finances aren't doing so well. But she keeps her head held high. And she's trying to do it all alone. She is not trying to tell people, you know, feel sorry for me. Look at me. You know, I'm struggling. No. She's trying to keep it to herself. She's trying to be a strong mother, woman, and wife. In this Rexburg community or the Salem area, pretty much a lot of this uh, area are Mormons. They go to church. They kind of know each other, at least recognize each other. Many of them, a few of the neighbors anyways, become good friends with the Daybells. And we're going to let them share with us what they've seen during this time in 2019, and Tammy and Chad Daybell, their neighbors. And guys, just forgive my voice. Ever since I had COVID, it's been difficult. In the summer of 2023, Lori Vallow Daybell's trial is in session. Let's just say that there are several people that come forward and share what they believe they understood was happening during 2019. Um, with Chad Daybell, what they saw. Tammy Daybell was an active member in her 
church community. Chad Daybell was moving there to be close to his family members, especially his brother, I believe. But that family was not too keen on being too close with Tammy or Chad. In fact, Heather Daybell said she didn't even want this family to move near them. So can you imagine how Tammy Daybell, she had to come to this place, start all over, make new friends, and also feel unwanted by the Daybell family. But there were a few people that she was able to make a bond with. Starting all over in a new place, away from the family that she loved being around, was very difficult for Tammy. Now, several of these people surrounding Chad Daybell, they are also getting into this energy code healing stuff. And on True Hidden Crime, um, I'm going to give a couple of clips from a lady by the name of Bernadine that was a neighbor to Chad Daybell, explains some of how she sees uh, this energy code healing. That paused right. and said this, this, this. You know, part of the emotion code and the healing is that you can meditate to be able to see the future. You can... Um, you can access what they call the Akashic Records, A-K-A-S-H-I-K, Akashic Records, and see what's going to happen, okay? And so, you know, and, and then you go to the LDS side of it, it doesn't jive with the LDS side. So I got to a place, I actually had left the church for quite a few years because of several reasons and during this time i did a lot of study for myself what do what do i actually believe you know about all of this stuff and for me i decided that the emotion code and the theta healing stuff was taking me away from a piece okay. that i couldn't get thinking that way okay right now remember chad daybell Heather Daybell, many of these people are going to their church leaders and they're kind of bickering about one another. And this neighbor kind of confirms that she believes that the church realized there was a lot more going on than they're admitting to. So this is her. And when you and say the church, the church in Rexburg or the church as a whole? The church in Rexburg. Because I feel like there were a lot of people who knew exactly what was going on. State presidents, wives, state presidency, you know, people who, um, you know, the counselors, you know, normally there's like this hierarchy of leaders, right? There is no way people didn't know that a lot of this stuff was going on, especially with, um, Judy Rowe was pretty public. Her and Eric Smith were pretty darn public on YouTube and everything about what they believe. Yeah, okay. there were so many people. I, I think yeah. actually sometimes I'm, I just don't get interviews with people because as you point out, like the shame, the secrecy, don't want right. to be involved. The embarrassment. It seems that Chad Devo had several neighbors that were very supportive in his work and his ideas. Yeah, but um, off the record, I'll tell you something else. That okay. Why? I Yeah. But he was very, very supported by a lot of people, a lot of neighbors. Okay. One of those neighbors being mentioned, or their name being Classen. So here's another neighbor that testified in the summer of 2023 at the Lori Vallow trial. She said that she knew Tammy pretty well. So here we go. I think so. And... Tell us a little bit about Tammy. Tammy, Tammy was a great person. She was shy. She didn't like to be in the limelight, but she was very organized. She knew the computers very, very well. Whenever we needed to change anything, she could do it quick. She knew the computers really good. Um, whenever we planned an activity, or so she would say, let's keep it simple. Just keep it simple. And it seemed to work. That seemed to work how we, how we did it. And I, honestly, I think that's how she lived. Keep it simple. Did you have occasion to observe Chad and Tammy together? Yes, I did. 
not just at church mostly. And what did you observe? Well, at first it was they were normal. It was great and normal. Sometimes he would come to help set up the chairs for the activity that she would be over, and he would help that way. Um, in 2019, it kind of changed. Not that he was, he was more distant to her. So that was noticeable. And you said that was in 2019? Did Tammy ever talk to you about her marriage? No, she never said anything about it. Um, she did one time tell me her finances were um, a little strained, but she didn't talk about it with us. And when you would see Tammy, did you notice her slow down at all? No. Did you notice any change in her activity level prior to her death? No, in fact, I think it increased. Did she ever complain to you about any health issues? No. Did you ever see Tammy have any shaking fits? No. Did you ever see Tammy faint? No. Did she ever tell you that she did? No. Okay, let's back up a little bit. So now we're going to go back to the testimony of Miss Gilbert's husband, Todd Gilbert, and when he met Tammy and Chad. Do you know an individual named Tammy or Tamara Daybell? Yes. How do you know them? Uh, mainly, I knew that Chad was an author, wrote books, and when we moved into the area, we got to know him because of that reason. And, of course, Tammy was his wife, and so that's how we got to know them. And was there one of the two of them that you interacted with more often? Yes, Chad. How often would you see Chad? At least once a week, uh, sometimes in the yard, most of the time, at least once a week at church. And I may have missed it, but did you indicate when you'd moved to Chad, into Chad's neighborhood? Oh, it was March 2017. Did you meet Chad and Tammy fairly soon after moving there? Yes, it was within a week. Did you see Chad outside of church? Uh, sometimes. Not real often, maybe mowing his lawn or something like that most of the time. And you indicated you knew that Chad was an author. Had you read some of his books before? Yeah, read some of them, yes. Yeah. Did Chad ever discuss his religious beliefs with you? Uh, sometimes he did. Sometimes we talked mainly about the books that he had written. Uh, some of the stuff that he apparently, you know, uh, dreams and visions that he'd seen and how they related with some of the characters that was in his books. And when you say characters in his books, was it your understanding those books were fictional? Yes, he said they were fictional, patterned after his visions. Did it appear that he was trying to teach you things or just share his beliefs? Uh, at first, he was, was just sharing beliefs and just discussing his books. As time went on, he was pushing more that way towards teaching things towards the end there, or 2019. And did the things that he was trying to teach you resonate with you? Uh, if they were standard LDS church doctrine, it did. If they were not, I was kind of sitting on the fence. You know, I don't know <laughs> on that. So you'd listen to him, but you didn't necessarily hold those Right, I didn't say usually one way or the other. Do you recall a time in approximately February of 2019 when Chad came to your residence? Yes. And do you recall him making any kind of a statement that stuck out to you? Yes, he made the statement as he was leaving that he says, I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but Tammy has uh, seen a vision that Tammy's going to uh, die and move on before her 50th birthday. Did you happen to know how old Tammy was at that time? I didn't, but I figured she was around 47, 48 area, I thought. So this neighbor tells him that it's back in February 
just several months after knowing Lori Vallow and meeting her at one of these conferences, that he's predicting his wife is going to pass away before she turns 50. Chad is able to determine who he feels that is trustworthy enough to share his most intimate thoughts. For him, I believe him predicting his wife's death was a way of trying to make people see him as a true visionary because he knew that this was something that was going to happen by the hands of him and his lover. It's really amazing how stupid Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow think people are. They are so narcissistic that they believe that whatever they predict, especially when it comes to the death of people like Charles Vallow and Tammy, that these people are going to believe that this was a magical moment. This was a Sears moment. Chad Debo had told many people about this, including Julie Rowe, Audrey, of course, Lori Vallow, and several more people in this clique. Now, he's being more bold and open to even tell his neighbors. This is in February. Did Chad not think that any of these people might talk to someone else within their ward and it get back to Tammy? It's quite amazing to know that there were several people that did know and heard these things and didn't repeat it or even um, address it with Tammy Daybell herself. What this says for me is that Chad Daybell felt like he had everyone in this ward eaten out of the palm of his hands. And Heather Daybell will kind of confirm that by saying, you know, I'm warning them that this is not going to end well. And they believed him over me. Charles Vallow still had a few uh, of the LDS leaders in his pocket, on his side, trying to help him. Even so, it just went nowhere. Lori was great at avoiding getting caught. She just kept moving around until finally she knew there was an opportunity she didn't have to move around. If trouble should show its face again, she would just prepare to move around again and again. So we learned there are several neighbors surrounding the Daybells that are very supportive of Chad Daybell. It's almost as if he's trying to manipulate the ward, the whole entire ward. He is talking with these leaders in the area, talking with the neighbors behind their back. And he has seen this set several goals and ideas of building a tent city in the very area that he lives. Now, remember, Julie Rowe had been, actually, she had property donated to her. She had a lot of funding for her uh, future tent cities. And now Chad Daybell is kind of following those footsteps. He's trying to, you know, get people to buy property in the area, telling people this is the area to move to. This is the place we need to be for the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are even rumors going around several neighbors in that area where they are knocking down fences and preparing for these tent cities. Many of them are giving uh, any new onlookers or potential buyers of the area the side eye, trying to distract them from wanting to buy property out there because they want people they know buying this property. And I want to re say this once more. This is not for certain. But based on my research, it seems to me that Lori and Chad, they plan on building a temple on these properties, or at least one of them. And they actually can see this temple, though it's not there physically yet. It's like there's their spiritual uh, manifests of a temple that only they can see. And they'll ask people, can you see the temple? And they'll say, no, I can't see it. And the more that Chad Daybell's children are growing up, the more crazy he seems to get. Most of them have been on their missions. But he has his youngest going on a mission. And a few of them are getting married and starting their own families. 
Now, remember, June is when things really start to um, become a huge separation at, for Chad with his family, the life as he knew it before Lori Vello come into his life. We left off in a timeline. We're going to do a quick overview of June 14th about it's Chad Daybell's brother's birthday. According to Heather Daybell, Chad Daybell is not mingling with the family much. All there. We were all there. Um, that was, I think that, that was to celebrate Matt's mom's birthday because that was June. That was June 2019. Tammy was kind of AWOL. It felt like she, we had a big blue out dinner that she didn't come to. She was asleep in the room. Um, I did notice when I saw her at church, she was head down. Yeah, and I thought she's going through one of her depressive episodes, is what I thought. Brandon Boudreaux's grandfather dies. This kicks the argument between him and his wife, Melanie Boudreaux. They separate and get a divorce. Charles caught Lori using his name in order to reach out to her lover, Chad Debo. And Charles is, if I notice, he's starting, instead of being upset, and crying he's getting more angry and he's wanting Lori to apologize for saying all these lies like Charles was the one cheating when it was Lori the entire time let's go over that email once more hello Chad I hope you are doing well this is Charles Vallow from Arizona we really enjoyed having you stay with us back in November when you came to the preparing of people conference I appreciated you ta uh, taking the time to talk to me about the book I've been working on. Well, more than six months later, I still haven't made much progress on it, but I feel an urgency to get it done. As the managing partner of Wright Planning Group, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak at various conventions beginning in the fall, but everyone says I need to have a book available that summarizes my life and shares the principles I follow. So I will cut to the chase. I am willing to pay you well to help me get this book into shape as a ghostwriter. I really liked your, auto your autobiography and the tone you took in sharing experiences without, pre without preaching. Is there any way you could come here for a couple of days and help me get the book underway? I feel talking in person would be much more valuable than a phone call or video chat, mainly because I would like you to read through some of my journals and explain to me how the publishing industry works. It would help me know whether I truly have a book in me and whether you want to team up on it. I played minor league baseball and have had plenty of stories that my audience could relate to, along with the knowledge I've gained running my own company. So I do feel the book would contain valuable information even beyond the convention circuit. I'm out of town until Sunday, but I would gladly fly you down here early next week before the holiday and cover your expenses. You can stay at our guest room like before or in a hotel if you, if, you, if you prefer. I hate to take you away from your family, but I know this book is vital to, to my speaking success. I understand if you don't want to take part in the project, but I would definitely make it worth your time. With admiration, Charles. It was very wild to see how easily she was able to see herself and this lie that she was Charles Vallow and to communicate as if she is that character. Imagine being Charles and finding this letter. How would you feel? And police will later confirm that there was no evidence saying that Charles ever sent this email. So who sent this email and why? Was Lori's intentions truly to write a book? Well, we know that she was interested in writing a book. She was keeping a journal. And I think she was very interested in attending and being one of the speakers for the Preparing the People group. Charles continues to reach out to his wife and these texts to Lori are completely heartbreaking. Yes, I do. And could you read that message? The message from Charles to Lori on June 30th. Uh, I believe that should be 2019. Uh, of 840, 0842. Uh, Lori, 
I know you don't care how I feel, but just imagine this. How could my actions or breaking your heart result in what you've done? You accuse me of infidelity, but it's you who have been having an affair. It just keeps killing me. Maybe that's your goal. How can you live with yourself destroying our life, Mel and Brandon's? Probably Mel and Brandon, too. Now add Chad Daybell family, and you've got a home run. The fact you will continue to go to the temple after all you've done shocks me. There really is something wrong with you. I really don't want to do what I have to do, but you have to be exposed for what you, for what you really are. You won't even deny it or talk to me as to your reasons. That's what's amazing to me. You could ally some of what's about to happen, but I don't think you will. Lying has become second nature to you. You have been impressive in blaming me for all that's happened. You have destroyed me. I've never seen, I've never been lower in my life. It's you that has done it. Please tell me why, please. I will slow or minimize what's about to happen. It's you who has caused it. We have a son to raise, but that's all we have in common. I will work with you in his best interest and will be there Monday evening. You owe me an apology for all the false accusations you've made. You know, I've been entirely faithful to you since the first day we met. I deserve an apology from you. Please respect that much. And you indicated that message when you located it would have been sent on June 30th of 2019. Correct. You can hear it in Charles Fellow's voice. He's trying to move forward. He's broken. He's destroyed. And he's probably thinking back to Joe Ryan about now. Because who broke that man? Lori Bellow. And he died broken. He's starting to realize, you know, at this point, I can't keep lying for you. I can't keep saying love always wins. Because she's making that impossible. Charles was in a major battle with himself. He was angry. He was hurt. He wanted to get her out of his life. But at the same time, he was too afraid to let her go. And he would do anything to keep her in his life. And after Charles Vallow had just poured his heart out with this text full of feeling and dismay, he begged for an apology, and Lori would not respond. She wouldn't give him the time of day. She, it seems as if she wanted to allow him to continue to suffer. And it seems whenever Charles can't get a response to Lori, he goes to a drastic, kind of like a threat, like, I'm going to talk to Tammy if you don't respond. In a text, July 1st, 2019, that's exactly what he does. Charles to Lori, I'm going to Idaho first to meet with Tammy Daybell. Lori responds to Charles uh, a minute later. She won't see you. She is my friend. She won't listen to you. Go ahead. You are ridiculous. Are you coming to JJ for the fourth or not? Charles responded to Lori. Uh, July 1st, 2019 at 1037. Then you tell me why you used my name and, and fictitious email to send a BS email about a book. I am having him ghostwrite for me. It's fraud and a lie. There's no reason for it other than to get him in Arizona and have an excuse for his wife. Charles Tolori, July 1st at 1038. You did this. I had nothing to do with it. And you know it. Also, he did not stay with us in November. I will find out. Meanwhile, Lori continues to groom everyone else in her group. And at this point, with all that Lori and Chad are doing, it's all against every belief, faith, part of their faith that they follow. So it seems that religion has become a tool for their manipulation schemes. And I started to wonder, did either of these two ever believe in their religion, their faith, or God ever? There's a text that shows up where uh, Alex Cox says, my 
lips are sealed. And he sends that to Lori, and Lori responds with, good boy. Around this time as well, they are doing more podcasts. Um, I guess it's 24, Time to Warrior Up, Redeeming Our Entrance into His Presence. So this is where they're going to talk about more of the girls um, gaining more authority in this faith. So I'm in a hurry today. I'm going to have to stop here. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and don't forget to share one of the girls' missing faces today. Love you guys, and I'll see you guys soon.